Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to another Swift Half with Snowden with me, Christopher Snowden. The first Swift Half with Snowden of the year. I hope you enjoyed the last one of Andrew Lillico. I think if you watch it back, you'll find that most of uh, what was predicted more or less came to be. I think Lillico was a little bit more pessimistic than me and needless to say i had the last laugh but i think um considering where we were when we filmed that it's around about the 15th of december i think things are looking like they're spiraling out of control and things now seem to be spiraling back into control which is nice hope you well happy new year um without any further ado let's get on with uh, with, with the interview as you know if you've seen the show before this is just a friendly half hour chat with somebody i know or i'm interested in or i think you would be interested in and uh this week it is none other than gb news presenter tom harwood hello tom how's it going it's going very well thanks how are you i'm all right considering yeah i mean i should say we're recording this on a, on a monday night it's a bit cold out there so of course we'll be coming out on on thursday tom is uh, is boris still going to be prime minister by thursday Boris still will be Prime Minister by Thursday. I have to say it feels a lot warmer for me this week than it did last week. Much of last week I spent standing in the coldest street in Britain, uh, Downing Street, which of course, um, if you're there in the morning, um, it's completely the wrong orientation for any sunshine at all. So it's sort of a unique <laughs> microclimate of absolutely uh, frozen reporters. Standing Was that there. worse so than Glasgow in most... November? Because you spent a lot of time at, at COP26, didn't you? Well, at least with COP26, you were indoors and there were all these lovely diesel generators keeping all the delegates nice and warm uh, inside the COP26 complex. Um, although I did get a little bit cold outside. But I, I, I have to say that I think that uh, one of the reasons that COP26 perhaps uh, wasn't the huge success that it could have been was that everyone was feeling so cold all the time. If they hosted it in an equatorial country, I think a lot of people would have thought the issue of climate change was much more pressing. I've often wondered that because they they had a cop in Denmark, in Copenhagen. I don't know when it was, probably getting on for 10 years ago now. Mm. And it was absolute middle of winter and it was very snowy. And you just think from an optics point of view, I know that one of the guys, he called James Hansen, somebody, one of the guys who was first pushing global warming in the 1980s, when he announced whatever new data he had, he did it in, a, in the middle of summer in a in an office somewhere in Washington DC, closed all the windows, turned all the radiators up, just you know, for, for the optics of it. I genius, don't know why they keep genius. doing it in these cold places in winter. Well, next year they're doing it in Egypt, so that might well wow. uh, be more fruitful. Uh, although it is, of course, it's, it's so interesting when people talk about climate change. It was Kevin Rudd in 2007 who sort of did his big differentiation. He was um, leading the uh, Labour Party in Australia at the time uh, and did his big differentiation from the Liberals on this issue of climate change. And the election struck in the middle of a drought, in the middle of a hosepipe ban and all that sort of stuff. And it played absolutely, completely well into his hands, um, although... Um, when people talk about it in the in the middle of winter when everyone's feeling like gas bills are going up and they really could do with a bit of global warming perhaps it doesn't land as well yeah so back to boris then um what's your what's your take on what's going on you think he's going to be around for a while to come do you I think it's safe for the moment, not least because who on earth would want to take over at this point in the electoral cycle? I think the most dangerous point for Boris will come uh, after the local elections on the 5th of May. If they go badly for the Conservative Party, that's a sort of a, a watershed electoral event where people may well swoop afterwards. I think that before then, there's so many problems that no one really wants to take on. They want sort of Boris to run through with the bad stuff before they might move. But that's a double edged sword, of course, because that gives Boris time to turn things around. And I think one of the interesting things at the start of this year, in that first week in January, was that the polls started to tick back up for Boris and for the Conservative Party. So we saw really dire polling for them uh, at the end of December when Allegra Stratton and that video was at the forefront of voters' minds. By the time we started talking about Omicron, by the time things sort of moved on beyond Christmas, maybe there was a bit of a bounce for the fact that Boris didn't lock down England in the same way that Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland were under restrictions. But whatever it was, polls showed the gap closing. I think they were fell to only four points behind Labour by that week 
until of course Monday night when those extra stories dropped and everything Monday night last week that was when those extra stories dropped and everything started to spiral again for the Prime Minister he went into hiding for the best part of two days before a sheepish apology at Prime Minister's questions and and the spiral has uh, gone further down ever since but I think that does show that sort of boomerang effect the yo-yoing of the polls that have taken place in the last three weeks it shows that when people are focused uh, on this particular story and when people are thinking about parties and thinking about where that what they were doing during the height of the misery of lockdown they're very angry but when the conversation can be moved on potentially that gives a road to recovery for the prime minister so just the fact that i don't think we're going to get close to the 54 letters required to be sent into sir graham brady's office the chairman of the 1922 committee to force that internal no confidence motion within the conservative party the fact that that's not going to happen for the next few months uh, really gives boris a chance to turn things around well that, that's very interesting because the, the polls are really pretty desperate for the conservative party at the moment um and i suppose a local election defeat is pretty much priced in isn't it for any any government in midterm so I how mean, bad do you think it would have to be you, you think it would, they'd have to be behind in the polls for uh, for the rest of the year basically before they consider getting rid of him or the next i think there months. might be there might be moves if the local elections are particularly Dire. Of course, many MPs are actually very sort of intertwined with their local associations. And if a lot of the people that prop up MPs in their local associations have lost their jobs as councillors, that can really change the parliamentary arithmetic pretty quickly. Uh, but also, it's not always the case that midterm governments lose local elections. Of course, the, the sort of the huge concurrent, almost midterm set of elections that we saw last year, the Conservatives did actually pretty well. They, uh, they held strong in Scotland. They, uh, they, they, they held uh, a, a number of mayoralties by some pretty considerable margins. I mean, Ben Houchin getting in with 70 plus percent of the vote uh, in the Tees Valley. And of course, Andy Street winning Birmingham again. There was a lot to boast about for the Conservatives. And of course, actually in London, doing better than a lot of people people predicted uh, uh, Sadiq Khan not getting in on that first round, having to go for a second round. And of course, Nicola Sturgeon not getting that majority that she craved in Scotland. There was a lot, there was a big positive story to tell for the Conservative Party in the last set of local elections in those big concurrent, uh, almost midterm elections. But uh, this time, this time it's going to be pretty tough. And I think that the one advantage that the Conservative Party has is everyone thinks they're going to tank. Um, so it, it'll be interesting to see just how badly they tank. But as I say, uh, May is a few months away. And if the Conservative Party can reset the agenda, start talking about some other things, as we've clearly seen this week, there's an attempt to Operation Save Big Dog or Operation Red Meat or whatever uh, the tabloids want to call it. They're sort of throwing out red meat to Conservative supporters. And this is the other interesting thing about polling at the moment. Um, Boris has never been popular with people who voted Remain and never been popular with people who voted Labour. The particular problem in terms of his net approval right now is that he has tanked amongst those who voted Leave and those who voted Conservative. So the way to build that back up isn't to potentially do a big broad um, brush strategy in terms of reaching the whole electorate. He just needs to do some pretty Conservative things and that will bring back some of that conservative base that slipped away. Yeah, I'm quite interested in this Operation Red Meat, um, which is all part of the Operation Save Big Dog initiative. That's hilarious, these names. Really. But apparently these are the real names they're using. Number 10 deny this, of course. Oh, but, do they? Uh, OK. Yeah. <laughs> but to say Big Dog, it seems that, that Boris Johnson has finally been forced to actually put forward some pretty good policies. Why, why does it take him to have his back up against... The, what are the policies? That he's going to drop all the coronavirus stuff, He's going to send the Navy in to try and sort out the illegal immigration problem. There's a couple of other pretty good things. I, I see. There's the BBC licence fee for BBC the fee, next yeah. two years. Uh, but these are the three big things that have been sort of teased out. Um, although I sent out a tweet about this, sort of why why does it take until Boris is on the, the edge of this precipice of, of a no confidence vote? Why does it take until multiple MPs are saying that he should go as leader before he starts doing this stuff? Actually, a number of Conservative MPs liked that tweet uh, when I sent it out. So I think that, I that, is, a, that is a bit of a well, it shows a that it's working. The red meat is clearly working but i would have thought these policies are pretty popular across the country it's not something just for like hardened conservatives is it 
No, I, well, I, I think it's it's interesting the the uh, polling around the BBC licence fee is always pretty divided. Um, people want to see tougher action being taken in the channel, that's for sure. In terms of coronavirus regulation stuff, this is very much uh, playing to the gallery of Conservative MPs rather than playing to the country who've always been a little bit more nervous than the Conservative MPs. Actually, one of the really interesting points is that uh, Labour voters tend to be the least in favour of restrictions, whereas Labour MPs are the most in favour of restrictions, whereas really? Conservative voters are the most in favour of restrictions and Conservative MPs are the least in favour. It's I didn't a very know that. mismatched thing. It's mainly due to age breakdown. Older people tend to vote Conservative right. and tend to be more worried about COVID and vice versa with younger people. Interesting. And how do you personally feel about all this party gate stuff? Because I... I theoretically I am quite angry about it you know and I do obviously see the hypocrisy everybody hates hypocrisy and you know when you you kind of the main thing for me it's been been reminded of how crazy the rules were like mm. in 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 2020 especially I'd forgotten that it was only legal in May 2020 to see one person outside your house if you maintained 2 meter distancing for example so I I I do think it's disgusting when you think about what they were up to having made these rules, but in my heart hearts, I can't get that livid about it. I think because the, the rules were kind of should have, you know, even though they made them, I, I can't get angry with somebody breaking a bad rule. How do you feel about it? Yeah. I think one of the interesting things here is Boris clearly hated the rules as well. Yeah. And yet he implemented them anyway. And so I think there's an, there's a point of irritation there about how was he so weak willed with some of this stuff. And the most irritating thing for me is just how much alcohol has featured as a prominent part of all of these events, whether it's Sakir Starmer drinking a beer, or whether it's wine and cheese or a drinks party in the garden or all of these things to do with drinks coming from the people who voted for and designed the rules that restricted drinking for everyone else, the whole, you're not allowed alcohol in this, you have a substantial yeah. meal, the curfew, all of this nonsense that I think uh, many people, I'm, I'm sure you were very um, uh, outspoken about yes. this at the time. I think very I was as well in thing, terms yeah. of, I mean, I, some, and, and these, these restrictions were just clearly bonkers. But the most irritating thing is that clearly people in power thought they were bonkers as well. So is this people sort of doing a deliberate, oh, we, we don't matter, we're above this? Or are these people People who've been so captured by the healthcare establishment that they felt that they had to go along with these rules that don't seem to actually have done all that much at all over the course of the pandemic. So uh, I think that's the point of irritation is, is it do we have a very weak willed prime minister here or do we have a prime minister that doesn't really believe in anything and will try and take the course of least resistance, whether that's just accepting uh, restrictions or, or, or whatever. And I think that that might play into a bit what's happened over the course of the of, the, of this parliament over just over two years, whereby housing reform has been shelved, it's been put in the too difficult box. There's been lots of other things that people were hoping that this historic uh, government with an enormous majority, the largest conservative majority since Margaret Thatcher, you would hope that there would be some Margaret Thatcher style reform agenda. Uh, and, and yet, if we look at actually what's been achieved, it, it looks like there's there's less being done than even David Cameron managed to do with uh, with many, many fewer Conservative MPs. So this points to the latter of your two options there, that he doesn't really believe in anything. And by implication, that it wouldn't be a bad thing for him to go and be replaced by somebody who, who does. I mean, is, is that the best argument for him being deposed, is that you might find someone who has some, I mean, you might not necessarily get the right person, of course, but you, you could well get somebody who we would consider fairly sound and might use the next two years productively. And this is the agony in the minds of Conservative MPs right now. And you can really raise an eyebrow in terms of who has called for Boris Johnson to go. On the one hand, you've got people uh, like Caroline Noakes, very much on the left of the Conservative Party calling for him to go. But on the other hand, you've got Andrew Bridgen, very much on the right of the Conservative Party calling for him to go. Now, these two different MPs have very different people in mind when they think of who they would like to replace Boris Johnson. And they can't both be right. And I think one of the interesting things about the way that the Conservative electoral system works and how it can so be gamed and changed and uh, is deeply unpredictable. Who would have thought in 2016 when David Cameron uh, resigned uh, and, and we had that leadership contest, who would have thought we'd end up with Theresa May? I don't think anyone uh, on the Brexit campaign would have thought that that was a likely prospect. And yet uh, she became prime minister. Uh, it would have been Andrew Ledson, of course. 
It, I, I think it, actually if Andrea had held her nerve, it's more likely than not that she would have ended up being prime minister if she'd have um, sort of held her nerve over, uh, over that weekend after that Sunday Times story, the whole um, I'm a mother, I'd be better because of it mm. stuff. If, if, if they'd washed over that and it had ended up going to some hustings and, and leaders debates, my gosh, I think Andrea would have wiped the floor with Theresa May. I think she would have won hands down with the Conservative membership. She probably wouldn't have been as popular in the country for the first uh, few months that Theresa May was, but uh, she'd have ended up Prime Minister. Interesting parallel universe. I wonder how that would have um, panned out. I mean, and there would have been no 2017 general election. And just to uh, take that alternative path of history a little bit further, that probably means that there isn't the reverse Brexit campaign that only came up after that 2017 election, you had all of these Labour MPs in particular thinking that they were going to lose their seats because they'd voted Remain and their constituencies voted Leave because the last electoral event was that referendum. As soon as you had the 2017 general election, you had a lot of Labour MPs who suddenly realised that, oh, these people will vote for me despite myself voting Remain. And that gave them a lot of false confidence in terms of um, starting to go against the referendum result in a way that they never did before that election result. So in some ways, uh, potentially Brexit would have been done sooner as well. Very good point. I mean, you, you I'm not going to gainsay you because of your prognostication skills in the past. I remember on Newsnight, what year would it be? 2019? 19, that would have been, yeah. And if you and various other pundits, Stephen Bush, I think was there, were asked how things are going to pan out and you more or less said how, how things actually did pan out. Everybody thought it was hilarious that you were coming up with this uh, plan in which there's election going to be called and Boris was going to wipe the floor of them and it's all going to be pushed through. But it, more or less exactly right, wasn't it? It was quite funny at the time. There were all of the sort of blue tick brigade on Twitter quote tweeting that uh, that news night uh, whiteboard scenario where we put forward what's going to happen next and next and next. Uh, and they were laughing uh, at, at the suggestion that, that Brexit might actually happen or that Boris might actually win an election. But actually, if you if you sort of took a step back at that time, and I think it was it was something like like it, it, it was the week before Boris became prime minister, I think that was that was right. Um, so every, everyone sort of thought, OK, obviously, Boris is going to beat Jeremy Hunt next week. What happens then? How does Brexit get done or does it? get done, what happens? And everyone was thinking, oh, people will defect, the Conservative Party will um, implode, there won't be a new deal, Boris doesn't want a deal, Boris wants to go for no deal. And actually, you, you didn't have to look that hard at the situation to, to, to really see the game plan here. Um, Number one, the Conservative Party had already, over the course, since Theresa May announced her resignation, the Conservative Party had been building back up in the polls. Remember, in the European elections, it got 9%. The first time it got single figures, percentage points in any national election uh, for, well, I, I dare say, hundreds yeah, of years. Much, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and, and yet, uh, just a few months later, it had built up to a, a fairly steady first place in the polls. Now you could start to see that trend very clearly upon uh, the presumption in the election, that, in the electorate that Boris would become prime minister. He'd take all of those Brexit party votes because uh, of course at the time that Theresa May uh, resigned, the electorate was split pretty much evenly into four camps, Brexit, Tory, Labour, Lib Dem. And so if you can amalgamate two of those, you've got a very, very easy road to victory there. And, and the other thing is that people were sort of thinking, oh, Boris's uncompromising attitude is going to make a deal less likely. I think that precisely the reverse is true. Um, de deadlines are what focuses minds and what makes deals. And the other thing is having the, uh, the strength of character to say, if you're not in favour of this stuff, you're going to lose the whip. You're not going to be in the Tory party anymore. And that allows that amalgamation of Brexit and Conservative Party voters, making nigh on half the electorate, uh, delivering a pretty solid victory. So it didn't really matter that Boris kept losing um, or, or was going to keep losing in Parliament um, because he, he really, if anything, wanted that Parliament to collapse in order to have that general election. Yeah, yeah, and I, I do remember people 
sort of not understanding this line from Boris that, you know, I'm going to walk away and I'm serious about it. You know, the whole problem mm. with Theresa May was that nobody really believed she was going to walk away. Whether but also Boris was on bluffing, the other we'll hand. never know, but he certainly com- managed to convince a huge number of FBP accounts on Twitter that he was deadly serious. Yeah, well, well, absolutely. People started thinking, oh, he wants no deal as his preferred outcome mm. because some sort of disaster capitalism, inverse logic of the economy going bad, being good for him, or some, some ridiculous nonsense like that. And yet it's, it's really not hard to understand the logic of you're not going to get a good deal unless you're willing to walk away. That doesn't mean that walking away is your preferred option, but it means it's better than a bad deal, as, as, as uh, Theresa May actually once said, famously yeah. said without believing. Exactly. So COVID, we already touched on it, and I hope this is in the last uh, swift half of Snowden where we're going to be talking about it very much. Uh, but you've been a COVID, uh, a corona centrist pretty much all the way through, like myself. Um, is it over now, basically? Well, according to the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, it might just be, um, which... I, oh, they've I, adjusted I, their model again, have they? Oh, have they? I, 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 I don't know. I've what they've done since since uh, last week, because there was um, there's a chap I forget his name who's uh, who's, who's from there who was saying that, that the whole the, the United Kingdom or England specifically will is likely to be the first country in the northern hemisphere right, to sort yeah. of go to an endemic stage of COVID. Um, but also just on the politics of it, I think it's much much more likely that we'll start to drop these restrictions sooner in England, if anything, just to save Boris Johnson's skin. Now, I, I think that probably that means that the Conservative backbenchers are winning against the scientists, but potentially uh, it's about the right time that they start winning that argument. Just looking at the numbers, how Omicron seems to be plummeting now, how uh, we sort of seem to have, if Omicron really was end game COVID, and I think that it's probably overwhelmingly likely that it was us getting through that and with uh, as immune population as we are ever going to have um really it's 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 going to get to the point once we're out of this winter it's now or never uh and i and i think that's probably going to be uh, the the end of of sort of pandemic proper uh in england at least it feels to me as if the kind of the zero covid forces the people are constantly asking for restrictions it seems to me now they're they're pretty much beaten and 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 down and out you know i don't see a lot of enthusiasm um from any of the the modelers from even from independent sage um i'm not getting stories anymore i'm not seeing stories of nhs you know hospitals saying oh my god this is this is horrendous um i i I don't sense any real fight in in any of the apart from you know a few fringe accounts on Twitter. Yeah. Apart seems from to the, me the, like the, the whole... Japanese soldiers on Twitter that will, exactly, will continue yeah. to fight ten years from now, saying we should still be in lockdown. Um, but no, I, I think the most interesting thing here is that looking at Wes Streeting and Sakir Starmer mm-hmm. over the weekend and on Monday of this week, trying to claim that they were never calling for further restrictions at the end of last year at all, when there's very clear video evidence of, of Wes Streeting appearing on the BBC suggesting that he was calling for further restrictions. But if even the Labour Party now is trying to rewrite history, saying, oh, no, we didn't think that uh, further restrictions were necessary then, we would have done what, exactly what Boris Johnson did in England, despite Mark Drakeford in Wales um, going for really quite draconian uh, restrictions uh, after Christmas, which I always found absolutely bizarre. I could see an argument for trying to limit a huge amount of intergenerational mixing on one day on the 25th of December when we were at the peak of uh, these hundreds of thousands of Omicron infections. I could see the logic in terms of saying everyone calm down a bit, even if it's just sort of voluntary advice, maybe spread Christmas out a little bit. Uh, that that sort of made sense to me. But the idea that we'd have uh, restrictions going right through January after the expected peak of this uh, wave of Omicron was, was always bizarre. And I think a lot of the scientists said it was bizarre as well. And yet in yeah. Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales, that's exactly what we saw happen. I think it's 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 uh, pretty incredulous to, to think that the Labour Party wouldn't have done the same in England. Yet now, now that's what they are sort of claiming, which I think probably lends... Uh, us all to think that if even the Labour Party is now thinking it's in their electoral interests to say we would have kept stuff open, uh, we're really in the end game now. And it seems to me that Drakeford and Sturgeon are not paying any kind of political price for overreacting. And uh, to be fair, it's only with hindsight we can see they're overreacting, but they were definitely overreacting. I read something in the Sunday Times this week saying that Mark Drakeford is pretty much the most popular leader 
in the United Kingdom, despite the fact, as it said in the article, despite the fact that there's been absolutely no difference in the infection rate or hospitalizations, mortality between England, Scotland and, and Wales, um, which makes you think, and I'm not flying the great flag here saying that, you know, merry old England, we, we do what we want, because there's, there's plenty of pro-restriction people in England. But it does feel as if the Welsh and the Scots just like a, a kind of firmer smack of government. And if that's what they enjoy, then, you know, who are we to deprive them of it? You know, and devolution was never necessarily designed to give these nations extra freedom. If they want to use it to have less freedom, who are we to, to gainsay them, I suppose? Oh, I think that the way that we've uh, uh, take, taken on this this pandemic in terms of the the, the absolute uh, Devo Max approach that we took with this pandemic, I think will be seen in the rearview mirror uh, once we're sort of past this and once the inquiry is fully underway and all of that. I think it will be seen to be one of the biggest mistakes of this pandemic that we had such different for the sake of it rules across the United Kingdom. I mean, there was that case uh, just last week of the uh, of the football ground half of which was in mm. Wales and half Chester, of which yeah. was in England and 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 was was facing fines from the Welsh government because of it. I mean we've had I think the, the club is in England policies, but the the ground but the stadium is in, is in yes yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and and we've just had the most ridiculous set of, of different policies but you're right uh, not that different in terms of outcome but that's not the impression that people have I'm sure if you asked anyone anywhere across the United Kingdom and, and took a poll of just about anywhere, they, they would probably suggest that the death rate was lower in Scotland and Wales than it has been in England, even though that's not significant, statistically significantly the case. Um, so, so to some extent, impression, well, to, to a huge extent in politics, impression matters more than reality. Uh, and, and, and also, I think it's very hard to tell the difference between is, is Nicola Sturgeon and our Mike, Mark Drakeford and Nicola Sturgeon, um, and indeed are the Northern Irish executive, although that's different for obvious reasons, are they doing better now simply because of Partygate and by comparison they look better? What would happen in the counterfactual where none of these party stories broke, where we had an absolute comparison between what went on in England and what went on in the other countries of the UK. Potentially, by comparison, Boris would look, be looking better, but the waters are so muddied in terms of public opinion, it's very hard to tell. It's certainly made for an interesting set of natural experiments. Anyway, you've got these countries bordering one another, and you can, you can see their outcomes. Really, England should have a much higher death rate just because London's there. To be honest, you know, there's a reason why New York State has a much higher death rate than Montana. It's not necessarily down to their their pandemic um, preparations. It's just they've got a major travel hub there. We also have the Alpha variant, of course, emerged in in, in southern England. So uh, in a way, it'd be remarkable if England didn't have a higher rate. But I don't think it particularly does, or it's much of a muchness um, in any case. Let me just ask in in, in closing something you've been writing about recently. Um, your one man crusade to um, increase the fertility rate of Britain. Why is, uh, why is this so important to you? Well, I mean, I'm just looking at, at um, my prospects uh, for a pension, really. It's entirely selfish. Um, and just the fact that we have uh, basically inversed our demographic pyramid, there are going to be lots and lots and lots of very old people in pretty short order and not very many young people. And of course, uh, we have a sort of Ponzi pension scheme in this country, whereby it's the it's the those in work who pay for those who are retired it's, it's national insurance is such a misnomer there's no pot that this cash has gone into it all it's all general taxation current spending and so we we are heading for a pretty worrying situation where the tax base is shrinking and the demands of expenditure are growing so simply from uh, a, a position of, oh, oh goodness, this country is going to plunge itself into a really difficult financial situation unless we uh, have more younger people. Uh, that's that's point number one. But also just on a on a point of liberty as well. I mean, if we look at fertility intentions of families and of women in the United Kingdom, they are uh, above replacement. The average woman wants to have at least two children, whereas, whereas the average woman in the UK at the moment is having about 1.6 or 1.7 children per family. We're very much below replacement. So there's a mismatch here in terms of people wanting stuff that they can't have, mainly because they feel priced out because we have such, such a broken, over-regulated housing market in this country and also broken, over-regulated over -regulated childcare where they, you've got ratios of young children. You need one, one adult to every three young children. It's, it's absolutely 
bizarre of course it's going to be incredibly expensive so you've got those problems so so not only is there an economic problem there's also a problem in terms of people not being able to do what they would like to do which in many cases is have more children and then of course there's the weight in the world argument um uh, it, the whole of uh, western europe and america as well actually sort of very stagnant populations growing economic uh centers of gravity in in africa and asia we risk becoming less relevant if we're less big yes i guess so what's what's your optimum population size for the united kingdom have you got a figure in mind because i know the estimates just gone down last week it was meant going to be something like seventy five thousand in 10 years now it's going to be 70 quite a big difference obviously um what's uh, what would you like it to be by the time you draw your pension well, I've uh, I, I wrote an article for for CapEx last week um, saying that I'd like a hundred million Brits. Now, a couple of people took me to task on on this, saying that it's uh, it's like a sort of Soviet production target, and it's it's, it's not like I, I sort of really desire a nice round. I mean, I, I literally picked that number because it's nice and round and it's bigger. What I am really saying is I want a much bigger population. I think 100 million sounds quite nice. And also, it's not out of the realms of achievability. I think we we really should be the most populous country in Western Europe. Um, but also, I mean, the, the age old thing is that America should obviously have why aren't there a billion Americans? Why aren't there a billion Americans? Uh, it, it, it seems bizarre. I mean, their country is so large, they, they would have if they if there were a billion Americans, it would have the same population density as France. Like it, it's so yeah. easy uh, to, to do. So I think that that, that is the really obvious one. I think for Britain, we should just go as big as possible. And I think there's some really exciting opportunities here to, to build some new mega cities. I think it's bizarre that we only have one significant city uh, in, in the whole of the UK. You look at the oh, population of Edinburgh. you'll get complaints from saying that, Tom, don't say that. Well, did you look at, look at all population and the terms? Like, it. <laughs> like you've, got, you've got wonderful, beautiful cities, which I love, that have tiny populations. I mean, Manchester, the population of Manchester is around 1 million people. The yeah. population of Edinburgh is 600,000 people. These aren't significant population centres when they really should be. Manchester should look more like New York. There should be loads of incredibly tall buildings uh, and, and, and new industry there in, in uh, relation to its heritage. But also there are some pretty dilapidated towns on the coastal uh, parts of England, especially, that we could easily build up into some um, amazing uh, new urban centres and, and host millions more people. I think uh, there's some grand opportunities to build up and think bigger and stop having this sort of cheems mindset that we are uniquely the only country in the world that can't have these glittering tall cities in formal, in, in, in sort of places that that now seem a bit run down. No other part of the world thinks that their best days are behind them, and, and we shouldn't either. All right, and we want super casinos on these beach resorts as well. That's a way to rejuvenate the South Coast, or indeed any coast around England. Tom, our time is up. Thank you so much for coming on. It's always great to hear your take. Just remind us when your show's on, on GB News. I'm Monday to Friday at 9.30 until 10. It's also half an hour, a very easy, very easy watch uh, in the mornings. It's very good. I've been on a few times. Hope to be on again sometime soon. Take care. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to you at home for watching. Um, if you'd like to give us some money, of course you can. Uh, and we will keep your name private. We are one of the top rated think tanks in Britain for donor confidentiality. You can go to www.iea.org.uk slash donate, or you can go to patreon.com slash IEA London. Um, any donations gratefully appreciated. Your time is gratefully appreciated. We will see you again in a couple of weeks where we'll have another special guest. Until then, take care and keep being sound. Thank you and goodbye. Well, if you enjoyed that conversation, why not watch one of these other videos? And while you're here, remember to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. That way, you'll never miss out on a single IEA broadcast.